Remnant 2 is the sequel to Gunfire Games' third-person shooter RPG, Remnant from the Ashes. That game, released in 2019, convinced me that this series had enough potential to justify picking up its sequel, which itself launched on the 25th of July 2023 for PlayStation 5, Xbox Series and PC. On paper, there are plenty of games that strike a similar chord to Remnant 2. This game has strong RPG features and uses procedural generation to create levels. On the surface, it plays like many other third-person shooters. Having chosen to start this one on the veteran difficulty, I can also confirm that that curve puts this game in the massacre genre. That makes it stand out in what would otherwise be a fairly crowded pack of RPG shooters. The game starts with you creating an avatar in a fairly limited character creator, and then you jump into the world where humanity needs to fight off creatures called the Root. These are a parasitic plant life that thrives in dystopian lands across the many realities and worlds the game consists of. The enemy brings a seemingly never-ending plague of destruction and chaos, and your job, of course, is to stop it. This is a branching adventure that begins with your created character and their companion Cass, searching for a place called The Ward, a supposed haven amid the dystopian earthscape. This initial wandering serves as the game's tutorial, right up to the point where you are injured by the root, and two humans from The Ward arrive just in time to save your life. There are some locations here that you might recognise from the first game, and others that sort of hint towards supernatural goings-on, but mostly you travel to the other worlds here through the Worldstone because the story needs you to. There's a critical path indicated by doors with rectangular archways, and side content indicated by those with a curved archway. But it doesn't matter too much which of these you do, and in what order, as the game scales based on your level when you first enter an area. Clementine is the most prominent character in the game outside of your own avatar, but for someone seemingly so important, she isn't particularly well written. She's got some quips and exposition dumps, but the writing is very stiff, and is more about serving the practical purpose of pushing the narrative than producing good character development. It's sad that I can say the same about a lot of the other human NPCs here too. They all just fall into the category of dystopian survivor, and have the sort of personalities you'd expect. One of the more interesting characters, and the game's potential wildcard, Ford, is teased in the opening part, and then never seen again on the critical path, where the characters back at the hub fail. The weird NPCs you run into while out and about exploring are much more interesting. There are aliens who may request that you help them solve problems from within their own realms, and others who have been consumed by the root and serve the parasitic entity. These serve to deliver and inform the lore of the game world, and often have some optional dialogue. Of this bunch, it's the antagonists at the end of each world that are truly the most interesting. These work because the levels you've travelled through to get there are scattered with lore that builds these events up into a true showpiece, rather than you just showing up at the boss arena and killing something with no idea why. From the moment you first travel through the Worldstone, you are ejected randomly into one of the four worlds. On my first playthrough, this was a forest filled with wooden huts. On my second, I was tossed into a barren wasteland filled with the remnants of a high-tech society. Each of these worlds is split into areas, and it is your job to progress through the story of that area and reach the final boss and defeat it. Each level usually has a few encounters, and there are many of these before you make your way to the final boss. In gameplay terms, each smaller level has a boss or a key event of its own, and beating these gets you crafting materials that unlock new weapons or mods. As you explore, you pick up scrap, this game's currency, and other crafting elements. These are used to upgrade your gear or to buy consumable items, and this is really where the true RPG element of the game comes in. Your gear consists of a main weapon, a sub-weapon, along with a melee weapon, and in addition to that, you have armor pieces, amulets, relics, and up to four rings. You find a lot of rings in this game, and you will quickly acquire four if you explore early on. Relics and amulets are more powerful. They're rarer, but they are more powerful rewards. Your relic affects how you heal and recover resources, and your amulet is usually a larger buff to some element of your build. Weapons also have a mod slot, which is an alternate fire mode or ability. Some of these are weapon specific, and others can be swapped out with things you craft in town. 
weapons may also have a mutator slot, which is a further upgradable augmentation that allows you to squeeze out every drop of utility in your build. In addition to this, your character also has archetypes and traits. Archetypes are this game's classes. These range from the basic ones we knew about prior to launch to the hidden classes, which require you to acquire certain objects and take these back to the hub of World 13. All of these different classes have different abilities and passives, which range from outright damage to group-wide buffs and heals. You unlock these as you level up and gain experience, and can eventually equip a subclass, which gives you the abilities of two of these at once. If you master a job and raise it all the way to level 10, that job's natural perk, which you just get for equipping the class, becomes a trait that you can use for another archetype. In the case of my starting class, the Gunslinger, this trait increases the ammo reserves you can carry, meaning I can benefit from using that when using another class. Other traits can be unlocked and found as you play, with most coming as rewards from taking out boss monsters or completing events. You can put points in these and increase your character's natural stats, adding further to the ways you can make your build more powerful. These RPG systems are strong in a way that makes them incredibly satisfying. No piece of loot is devalued in the game, and it's easy to see the utility of each one, even if they don't work with your current loadout. As you progress through each level, you'll work your way through the rank and file pretty easily, as long as you have a little bit of patience and keep an eye on your surroundings. The bosses are a different story though. You have to learn these mechanics and patterns through the methodology of death. To name just a few of these incredible encounters feels like I'd be missing something important. But the ones that really stuck with me were the Labyrinth boss, which challenges you with avoiding giant slabs of stone while taking pot shots at glowing cubes. The Harrowing Root Dragon, which throws you in and out of some distorted, computerized loop. And the Floating Mirror of Madness, that punishes you for looking at it. Gunfire Games undoubtedly succeeded in creating strong boss fights and interesting encounters, and I can't praise that enough in this genre. Adding on to that, Remnant is designed to be replayed, and has value in doing so. Because of the procedural generation of levels, you won't see every encounter, or even every environment, on your first, second, or even third go. This means there'll be new weapons, rings, amulets, relics, and even new armor sets for you to get if you clear the game and re-roll the campaign. As the game scales with your character, you can be sure the new challenge is appropriate. That does come with a downside though. Once you pick your difficulty, you have to re-roll the campaign, including your story progress, to change it. Thankfully, they did see fit to put a drop of mercy in here amid the madness, in the form of Adventure Mode. This allows you to choose a singular world and run it independently to your campaign, so you can increase or decrease the difficulty here. Any gains you make to your character persist across both runs. Remnant is at its best when it leans on its RPG mechanics, and while shooting in the right direction helps, the skill ceiling for gunplay is fairly minor. This is in large part because the gunplay is fine but not good. Each trigger press feels more transactional than purposeful. Your character can also dodge and roll, and you have stamina to keep an eye on, but the true skill barrier is in animations, as these tend to linger a little longer than you'd like. If you're familiar with Dark Souls or Monster Hunter games, you know that you can often get stuck in a cascade of animations, where one small mistake ends with your death, no matter how hard you're pressing the dodge button. Remnant 2 does this too, and you really do have to learn these encounters if you want to survive. One area I feel the game did fall short of its RPG goals was that armor is purely cosmetic and cannot be upgraded. In the original Remnant from the Ashes, this was possible, and you could have set bonuses for certain playstyles. I'm sure Gunfire had a reason for this, but in a game that is this stat and RPG heavy, this omission sticks out like a sore thumb. I also wasn't a fan of the way that when you acquire a new item or trait book, the notification stays on screen until you manually dismiss it. This is a minor thing, but I feel these should have faded after a few seconds on its own, as these can be distracting when you're getting shot and in combat, and it just stays on your hood. In terms of gameplay faults, I'm coming back to animations again, but this time to do with enemy attacks and hit detection, which are a bit hit and miss. There are occasions where you're not sure which attack hit you and killed you, and that's an important factor in learning how not to get killed again. Finally, the death noise here really did get on my nerves. I brought this upon myself by dying, of course, and I died a lot. 
but this sound is the same whether you're shot, stabbed, poisoned, smashed, cut, or fall to your death. And to me, it always sounded like you were being burned alive. I'll overlook a lot of these small flaws, because the game came with a very reasonable price tag and a clear goal in mind. This does mean that a singular run of this is quite short, clocking in at around 20 hours, and that's including a considerable amount of exploration. The only noticeable performance issue I had throughout the 40 hours I spent with Remnant 2 was a render latency issue. This value tended to remain above 60ms throughout, and that was with DLSS in performance mode. The game was still very playable like this, but for the hardware I have, that latency kind of points towards an issue. This title is a bit more demanding than you'd expect. This is better looking than the original Remnant, but it still feels more like it's in that transitional era between PS4 and PS5 game. I'll make my conclusion quick. Remnant 2 is good. Its RPG elements and boss encounters make it stand out proudly, while the story is undercooked and feels like a paint-by-numbers, collect-the-thingy adventure. The highest praise I can give this game is that myself, a self-confessed solo player, I'm leaving this game installed on my computer for when my friends pick it up in the weeks and months to come. You can just tell this is going to be a good game to play with other players, and while I wouldn't dream of playing this brutal difficulty curve using matchmaking, I'll be ready to whip up a new character when others I know snap this up.